hockey fans. Welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. I'm Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan, your host on the only hockey program out there that is by a fan, for the fans, and you got to know about you, the fans. Got a really interesting show for you today. So let me take you back, all the way back to 1982. 1982, a young woman from Long Island, New York, goes into a recording studio and re-records a 1979 Italian hit called Gloria. Reworks the lyrics, releases it as a disco hit, and it is a smash! Number two in the U.S., number one in a whole bunch of countries. Really a great song. Um, propels her into the propelled Miss Laura Brannigan into the mainstream. Well, now let's flash forward all the way to 2019. January 7th, the Blues are in Philadelphia getting ready for their game the next day. They go, some of them have a friend there, they go to this private club called Jackson YB, watching a football game. Every time the Eagles do something good, somebody yells, play Gloria, and the whole place goes nuts. Uh, Alexander Steen and a few others really liked that energy, brought it to the locker room. Lo and behold, this is the start of the connection between a disco song and a hockey team. We've all heard about it, but we haven't heard it from is Laura's perspective. Now, unfortunately, Laura passed in 2004, but I was able to contact her leg legacy manager, Miss Kathy Golick. She agreed to do an interview. So, please, let's hear from Kathy how Laura and Gloria would have connected to our St. Louis Blues. Please give a great big warm welcome to Miss Kathy Golick. Hey, everyone, let's give a great big Blue Note Fan Report, welcome to Miss Kathy Golick. Kathy, welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. Welcome, guys. Thanks for inviting me to your show. Uh, Kathy, could you tell us a little bit about your connection to Laura Brannigan and uh, the Gloria song or the Gloria, just or your connection to Laura Brannigan? Sure. Well, uh, my story is rather unique. I started out as a fan. In 1982, there was this new singer, Laura Brannigan, with a smash hit out on the charts, Gloria. It was being played everywhere, and I just loved the song from the moment I heard it. I loved the energy about it. I thought Laura Brannigan had such an awesome, unique voice, and just, I thought, this is somebody, you know, I'm going to be a fan of, and for a long time, I'm sure. And so I was a fan, and over the years, I went to a few shows, and that's really where it stayed. I was, I was a fan just like many other people, like millions of others across the world. In the mid-90s, Laura took a break from the business. Unfortunately, her husband, Larry, he was diagnosed with cancer. So as Laura told me later on, she said, well, I, I did the only right thing that there was to do. I stopped the business, stopped my career, and I took care of her full time. So she did that. He lived another two years, and unfortunately, he passed away. That was in 1996. So at the time, no one was really hearing all that much about Laura, really really fans really didn't even really know what was going on with their husband at the time. The internet wasn't all that big yet. There, a lot of artists didn't have a lot of websites yet or things like that. So it was kind of still hard to get information about musicians or artists, especially if they were taking a hiatus and there was no music coming out, you didn't know why. But then it came out around the mid-90s, what had been happening in her life and losing her husband. And at the same time, uh, Laura took the time she needed to to of course, mourn his passing, Larry's passing. Of course, that's difficult for anybody to lose a spouse and go through that. But around 1998, she began getting in the studio again. She went to sing again. She started recording again. And she also did the odd show here and there. That was through the late 90s. In the early 2000s, she started recording a few more songs. As it became evident, she wanted at one point to put a new album out, so she was working on that. And she started to ramp things up and she wasn't really doing a ton of shows yet again, but increasingly doing more and more. So that's when I sort of saw her. I, I was back into all that, you know, she was doing shows, and I wanted to go out and see her perform again. So 
I started doing that, and really through the time she passed, uh, from early 2000 to 2004, I was at almost every show that Laura did, and I was a part of the group of regulars. She would look out, and she would see there was a group of us would try to go to almost every show, and she'd look out the first few rows. We'd be there. She felt real comfortable with that, so she was familiar with us, and of course, she would stay after after her shows and do meet and greets with the fans, and then after the meet and greet, there was a small group of us that she would spend more time with after the, the large crowd would leave. And so I would just hang around with her and stuff, and that was really exciting just to be a, a part of that, to, to be a fan of a singer all my life like that and sort of have, have to start to have that more personal interaction with them. So one thing led to another, and we just sort of clicked our personalities and so forth. And at one point, she did not have an official website, so I, my first official thing I did for her professionally on her behalf was her official website. So that's where I started actually working with her, making that transition from being a fan to the other side to actually doing something for her. And I did that for a while, and that was all well and fine. I, it was just awesome to be able to do something for her. And enjoyed doing that, and it was it was a great place for the fan base to gather and, and talk. We had a, There was no social media at the time, so we had a big discussion for them. It was very active, and... And we would, we would discuss the shows and just what was going on with Laura. I just had a great time getting to the fan base. And at one point, she was between management, so she was still trying to keep things going, recording songs. She was she was an avid cook. She loved cooking. She was in the process of writing a cookbook. Again, she was recording more songs for a new album, and she had a lot going on and, and really was trying to do some of these other things, like book shows on her own and so forth. So I, I, I noticed that, I knew that, and I just said to her, I said, uh, Laura, I'll help you. If you need some help, I'll help you do some of these things. She said, sure, that, that would be great if you do that. So I started to sort of fill in the gaps there with her for a while, and she just noticed that I was, I was pretty much doing everything that a manager was doing, and, and I was doing a good job at it. And so um, it came to a point where she asked me to be her manager. So that's, that's where things were. And then, unfortunately, she passed away. And then I transitioned to overseeing her legacy as her legacy manager. And I've been doing that for the last 15, 15 years. Uh, what's the name of your company? Other Half Entertainment. Now, from what I understand, there's an interesting story about how that name came up. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, a great story, and, and again, as with most things that I do, I like to have the focus on, focus on Laura. When we were thinking of a company name, I wasn't thinking about uh, putting my name or somebody's name, management, or anything like that, or entertainment company. I wanted to be solely focused on something about Laura. And that phrase, other half, is very synonymous with Laura. Her fans, her loyal fan base are very familiar with that. And she would, when she was in concert, she would look out at the audience and she would say, you know that you are my other half. I love you all, and I couldn't be up here doing what I'm doing if it weren't for all of you out there. And it just, it's a term, it's a phrase that really epitomizes how Laura felt about her fan page, just that real personal, loving connection that she had with them. So when it came time to name the company, of course, you sit there and think, well, let's see this, 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 this. And I, I thought of the phrase other half, and I, I'm like, that's it. So it's going to be called other half entertainment. That, that's a great story. I, I kind of have a, a little bit of feeling like that. I've been a Rick Springfield fan for decades, you know, and I went, waited over 35 years to see him. And I finally got to see him right. in concert here and got kind of that upfront, front row experience. And it was really, if I could follow him everywhere, I'd do what you did. I really would. <laughs> <laughs> I would do it. So, right. um, I listened to, I've listened to both the Italian version of the song and the English version, and they're different in the wordings. Can you tell us a little bit about how that song got changed? Yeah, well, the, the original song was recorded in 1979 by an Italian artist called Umberto Tazzi. He also co-wrote the song. Now, the differences between the two versions, his version is a love song. It, the music is a little bit, it's a little bit slower tempo, and really the difference between the two versions is a totally different storyline. His is about this imaginary character, Gloria, and Laura's version is 
about this girl that has some issues. Pretty much is the best way that I can say it. Yeah, she's a little confused and she has some issues. So, uh, Laura's Virgin, she did hers in 1982. Alberto Tati's was a very big hit in Europe. And Laura's first producer that worked on her debut album, Brannigan, which came out in 1982, he was German. His name was Jack White. So he was very familiar with the success of Totsi's Italian version of Gloria, and he thought that the song would work really well for Laura. So they got it for Laura, and they're trying to work with it, and they're trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do with it. Well, they ended up keeping the musical arrangement is, is pretty close, although, as Laura would always say, they gave it the American kit. And they made it a really energetic, especially the beginning, very energetic song, very full of velocity. And they originally, as far as the lyrics, they were originally going to change it to a male name, Mario, and go with it with that. It just, it just wasn't clicking. It just wasn't working. So eventually they decided to, and this is why the songs have two different storylines, because they decided to rewrite new English lyrics for Laura's version. So although the music sounds similar, again, two different storylines, two different, uh, you know, kind of styles too. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting that when Laura's version comes out, when you listen to the song and you talk about a woman having issues, well, at the time that right. the blues start getting, and I'll get into that in a second, the blues kind of, you could have changed the style of that song to blues, you know? What was going on with right. you guys? What's wrong in your heads? What's got, what's what's yeah, exactly, you know, was, exactly. That, that that's a that's a great analogy, guy. It it really is, right? Because as we know, they're they they were at the bottom, bottom of the NHL, and and you know things weren't looking really good for them either. So yeah, yeah, great analogy. Here it is. It's January seventh, January sixth, I think seventh. I was actually, I had just gone to the game. They lost to the Islanders when they were up three to nothing and gave up four straight goals. I mean, everything's looking down. The Blues go to Philadelphia. A couple of the players know a guy that has, were, are, is a member of a private bar. It's called Jack's NYB. I think that's right. I get, them, I get it backwards a lot. Jack's NYB. Mm -hmm. And they're watching a playoff game. And there's a guy there that every time something good for the Eagles happens, yells, play Gloria. They play it, and the energy in the play. So Steen and a couple of the others start seeing that. The next night, they go, go to play. They say, hey, guys, we want to change the song. But this, Jordan Bennington starts his first game ever in the NHL and posts a shutout. And thus, the tradition of Gloria playing starts. When did you... Exactly. Say again? Exactly. Yeah. So when did you first find out about this play Gloria and the connection to the team? Well, I do Laura's social media, and I was on Twitter one day, and I saw a tweet, and it was from a St. Louis Blues fan. And I thought, oh, that's neat, hockey. Something I, and, and I'm seeing Gloria in this tweet. I'm like, hockey, Gloria, this, this is really interesting. So they were saying in the tweet that Gloria was being played, after the Blues won a game. And again, I thought, well, that's why I didn't expect to read that. I didn't expect any kind of association, again, with, with Gloria and, and hockey. So I thought, that, I thought that was pretty cool, an NHL team, a you know, professional sports team using it. But I really did think a lot more about it. I thought maybe it was just a one-off thing. Okay, somehow they played this song. They played Gloria, and okay, you know, maybe it's not going to happen again. Yeah, uh, so Jim Thomas... The, the Blues are in the middle of a great win streak. They're down in Florida. They're playing the Florida Panthers. After the game, Jim Thomas walks into the locker room and hears this song. So he writes, writes about the song, and all of a sudden, there is this explosion of downloads for the song and music requests. And, you know, all of a sudden, you're getting visit requests. Because, you know, right. like myself, I was surprised to find out that Laura had passed years ago. Um, when, right. how, how did, when this all starts coming to you, how surprised were you how big this got, this explosion of Gloria? Oh, I, like I said, I, I was just totally surprised. For me, I just started seeing more people writing about it on social media. 
and then I saw some media stories. You know, when the media picks it up, then you're gonna you're gonna think a little bit more about it. That hey, there's something more to this story, and just more buzz about it. And then one time I had a, you know the TV on, there was a game on, and I'm hearing the announcer say something about playing Gloria, and so I'm starting to pay more attention to exactly what's going on, and really. It's hard. It's hard to pinpoint, but it, it does just seem like it. I, it wasn't long after I found out about it that it just boom. It just exploded. It just exploded in such a big way, and all of a sudden, people, the teams making videos, companies are making videos in St. Louis. Children in schools in St. Louis are making videos. People are tweeting like crazy about it. We have this phrase now on Twitter: hashtag Play Gloria. <laughs> so it was. It was just. It was totally amazing, and I think that's that's the beauty of it. Also, is that it was not anything that was planned. It was totally organic. How how the origin, how it started, how the players became familiar with the song, and in turn brought it back to St. Louis, started to use it. It wasn't a NHL or or a St. Louis Blues marketing campaign or anything like that. And again, I think that's the true beauty about it. Is it, it just it just happened, and I think in life. Really, many times, no matter what we're talking about, the best things in life many times are those that are unplanned. And this certainly was unplanned. And it just really, really exploded into such a, a big phenomenon, I call it. A big phenomenon. So I'm, I'm wondering, have you had a chance to go to Jackson YB and meet the Play Gloria guy? No. Yeah, I, um, I did an uh, interview with one of the Jacks guys. I'm going to have to send that interview to you and get you guys connected. I think that would right. be a neat thing for you guys to meet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Kathy, I appreciate you joining us. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Guy Benson with the, Hawaii, the Blue Note Fan Report. Um, I'm the Hawaii Blues fan, and we'll be right back with Kathy Gola. Hey, Blues fans. What a great time for me to do a pet of the game. I haven't been doing these in a while, but you know what? I think this is it. This little guy is a Shibu. He's owned by Jeremy Brander, and his name is Saito. Saito is a, I think he said, seven-year-old dog. He couldn't, couldn't really remember what he said. It was hard to hear. But he told me that Saito likes, uh, when he's watching a game, he'll jump up in his lap, and he gets looks at him funny when he's uh, getting mad at the TV and all that, and I think it's great. Now, unfortunately, Saito right now, is having a, a bit of a, a tough time. He's suffering from a brain tumor. Um, but, you know, this is a good time to, to let Saito know that we're thinking about him, and that we care about him, and that we love all our Stanley Pups. Well, Saito, I want to say thank you to you and Jeremy for letting me highlight you as my pet of the game. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan in the Blue Note Fan Report. I'm talking with Kathy Goley. So, Kathy, this all comes about, and then all of a sudden, the Blues get on this playoff run. They go into Winnipeg, they win the first two games, and then they lose two games, and everybody's like, oh, same old Blues. And then they win that, and then the play Gloria really starts the countdown. Mm -hmm. One Gloria, two Gloria, three Gloria, four Gloria. <laughs> and that kind of comes from, and I know you're not a big in hockey, back in the mid-'90s, Ray Bork uh, started this thing called 16W. Uh, they were playing New Jersey, and the exit to go to the arena was 16 West, 16 W, and it takes 16 wins or 16 Ws to win it. So that's where the glory, we, instead of it being 16 W, we called it 16 Glorias. So you right. got to be a part of this playoff run. Can you tell us some of your experiences about being on the playoff run? Yeah, well, you know, I started watching the early playoff rounds here in my home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And at that point, of course, I wanted, I was getting more into learning more about the whole background story on the team and their season and everything with the song. So I really, and I was interacting a lot with blues fans on social media and I was having a great time doing it. So I, I wanted to watch the games. I wanted to be involved in, in knowing what was going on in the games and in the playoffs, and so I, I was watching from here. I, I was hoping they would win, just like everybody else. And I remember the first time I heard it, saw it on my big screen TV, and I heard Gloria coming up for a little bit before the the broadcast cut away. And that was just so thrilling to me. I was it was just so 
unbelievable. I, I knew it was being played, but to hear it for the first time through the TV and hear it with my own ears, that, that was just something that was, um, it, it touched me deeply and it was just such, it touched me for more and such just a unique experience. So when it became clear, when they progressed, they were in the first round, second round, third, now they're going into the Stanley Cup final. So I'm thinking about everything and I'm thinking, wow, that would be really great to be down there in St. Louis and be a part of that. And more so, I'm thinking that the song is so big, the team is in the Stanley Cup final now. Gloria is along for the ride with them. And I really felt that for Laura, that I needed to be there to represent her. The sad part about it all is Laura not being able to be here for any of this in person. So I definitely wanted to have her represented there. I, I felt she deserved to be and needed to be. So I made that decision to make the trip to St. Louis for the Stanley Cup final. So would, so, so would Laura have embraced this? I mean, you, you knew her very, very well. If she'd been alive today and still performing, or even if she hadn't been performing, she, you know, she'd retired and this came up, would right. she have embraced this phenomenon? Oh, she would, have, she would have totally embraced it. She would have thought that it was the neatest thing. But at the same time, she was very genuine, very down to earth. She would have been so, so humbled that the team would use it. And not just the team, but it, it became so big. If she would have seen the whole, really, it, it branched out to the entire city of St. Louis. And the Blues fans everywhere. And you're in Hawaii, you know, and you, you were caught up in it too. You know, so Blues fans everywhere in the city of St. Louis. So, exactly. So, you know, she just would have thought it was the neatest thing. And, and had she been with us, she certainly, we would have had her down in a big way. She, she would have been all for it. And she would have been right there alongside me. We would have been sitting together in Enterprise Center. And she would have loved to have participated. And, and she just would have thought, it, it was the greatest thing. Yeah, so uh, part of that question came from one of my uh, viewers, my, I call him a Hall of Famer now, Bob Morton. The other thing he asked is, uh, do you think she'd have performed the song like in the arena or at the parade? I, I think she would have performed it everywhere they would have asked her to. I think she, she, would, have, she would have been happy to perform it, perform it anywhere, anywhere, in, in the arena. Um, I, I thought too, it probably would, you know, I, of course she wasn't there, but you, you think what would it have been like had she been able to be there? I think uh, perhaps Charles Glenn may have lay, let, lay the mic down for one of the um, national anthems. I, I could see her possibly singing one of the national anthems before one of the games. I think that would have been neat. And uh, definitely, definitely. And with them with the whole thing. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. What I think would have been neat. It was for her and Charles to sing the anthem together. Oh, that's right. Right. Yeah, so the that other thing fun. is, so we're, we're, our time's getting a little short. Um, can you give us a little bit of your experience about the finals when you were there? How did St. Louis treat you? How were you treated in St. Louis? How did the team treat you? Uh, radio stations, the people, things like that. Yeah, well, I just want to say that when I went down there, it was an open-ended trip. I said, I'm going to stay here as long as they're winning, and I'm going to see this. I'm going to see everything through with the Blues. As long as they keep going, I'm going to stay here. I wasn't down there for one game and left or anything like that. So I, I was at every watch party and every game at Enterprise Center, game one through seven. I arrived shortly before the watch party for game one, and, of course, leading up to that big celebration after game seven, when we were in Enterprise Center watching on that Jumbotron as the second stick down and the Blues won their first Stanley Cup in team history and all the pandemonium that let loose. So I was there the entire time. I thoroughly enjoyed that. The people were so welcoming to me. I, I was able to meet the mayor and go around City Hall. Um, the Cardinals hosted me at Bush Stadium uh, one of the evenings at the game. Uh, the people, just the people, I love just being with the people, with Blues fans and, and St. Louisans. They were just so accommodating, so warm to me. It, it touched me so deeply, and, and they were so appreciative of having Gloria as this citywide song, really citywide anthem. Really, it really was. It wasn't really just even for the team, but it, it became a citywide anthem. And they couldn't have been warmer to me. And when I think of St. Louis, when I think of the people, it, I, I have a warm feeling in my heart, a smile on my face because they, they were just great and uh, they were 
mindful of Laura too, not also the song, but they respected Laura's legacy and her part in it as the singer. And I, I just can't say enough for how well the city and the people and the team also. The team, I had nice interactions with the team. Uh, they were supportive from the beginning. They saw me on social media supporting the team, and 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 you know, and they they were doing things to support the song and uh, putting videos up and everything. And it, it was just a nice report. Was a nice, you know, in the media when I wasn't attending watch parties or games, I had a lot of media opportunities. So it gave me a lot of time to talk not just about Glory and the Blues, but also about Laura and uh, some history on her as an artist and her career. So I, I just had a, I had a wonderful time. Everybody was just, just so great from, from print to radio to TV. Everybody in the media was great with me. It was just a great experience all around. Hey guys, this is coming from a Pirates fan now, talking about the Cardinals. So we like to think that in the Cardinal Nation that we have the best fans in baseball, but the quiet secret is we've probably got the best fans in hockey too. Um, I know right. I I know that you had met people from one of the groups, one of the Facebook groups, um, and you asked me if right. you could say a shout out to them. Go ahead, say a shout out to that group. Oh, sure. Yeah, even before I arrived to St. Louis, uh, I was contacted by a few people on a Facebook group that I love to be a part of called True Blue Nation. Just a super great, nice, fun group of hardcore, diehard blues fans. And they really enriched my experience. Once I got down to St. Louis, I was able to meet up with some of them. Some of them I'm closer friends with now, and I still participate with them. Uh, we talk, of course, in the group all the time, but when games are going on, it's kind of like a real-time thing. Everybody's comment back and forth, and I, I enjoy participating in that. And again, just, uh, just another great group of people from St. Louis, True Blue Nation. Well, with that, I'm gonna invite you to my group, the Hawaii Blues fan clan, and I'm hoping that you will accept that invitation. Uh, we got a pretty good sure. group too. Uh, and one last question for you, because we're running out of time. You, I know that you've got a lot of memorabilia over this thing that you you collected a lot. Um, could you tell me about some of the things that you have that you're going to cherish? Yeah, one probably the the thing the most would be the jersey. I had a custom made jersey made. And on the back, it's a blues jersey, of course, and on the back, it says Brannigan, and the number on it is 82 for Gloria release date. It was released in 1982. And this is a jersey that I wore. It's funny. I wore it a lot when I was down in St. Louis. Um, it just seemed like when I did interviews, it was kind of a neat thing. People wanted to see it, and, and I wore it, of course, to Enterprise, to every watch party and every game. And I had it on, of course, when they won the Stanley Cup. And so, and that, that again, was a big representation. It, it was my way of, of, again, melding together the blues and then Laura's part of it with Gloria and honoring her, honoring the blues, honoring Laura. So that, that and, you know, and that was a history-making moment when they won the Cup. So what we did after I came back home, after three weeks I was there in St. Louis, uh, we have an annual memorial gathering for Laura every year. And so we put together a blues display, a special blues and glory display. So we got the jersey, and we made a really nice jersey display for it, uh, put a photo of me in it from Enterprise, a photo of Laura, and then the jersey in there, and got a nice plaque engraved for it. And uh, that's, that's when I look at that, it make, again, it makes me smile. It reminds me of that whole time and, and just, just the team and winning the cup and Gloria. So... Um, and being there and wearing it when they won. So that's that's special to me, that jersey display. Oh, I, I, I can understand exactly how you feel. I mean, I've got a lot of jerseys and all that. So I will say this. I'm hoping that maybe this year or next year, depending, that I can make it to one of your groups. Because I have a feeling Glory, the Blues are going to be part of Gloria for a very long time. And I would love to go to one of your events and maybe film a show, show there if you wouldn't mind. If we could figure, we could figure some way out to make it happen. Yeah. That that would be great, and and that's the beauty of it. That's that's the real takeaway from everything, is Laura, Glory, and the Blues are forever connected now by this great story of the first Stanley Cup win. And so the legacy of St. Louis, the team, Laura's legacy, they're all interconnected now, and that, that's just that's a beautiful thing. So interconnected that they put in. I don't have my ring on. I have a fake ring. Like uh, you told me, you got one too. Like it. 
but it yes. has Gloria inside it. That's how connected we are. Right. Uh, Kathy, exactly. um, we've got a few few minutes left. Do you have any anything you'd like to say to Blues fans? This is your moment to speak to Blues fans on Laura's behalf. Again, I would just, I can't ever thank Blues fans enough for, it just, it, it, every, every time when I was in that arena and I would hear the song come up after they would win, it's still surreal to me. It still sends chills when I think about it. To hear that and to look around in that arena and see those fans just having a great time. They're so happy the team has won. They're singing along with the song. There's just really no words, and you know, again, I could go, especially that game seven when they won the cup. Just I was, I was screaming and yelling and happy, just like everybody else. But at the same time, I was just looking around the arena and hearing the song and just taking that all in and thinking about Laura and 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 the pride I felt for her at that moment. It just, I just want to thank thank every Blues fan for just just everything, how warm they were to me, how warm to Gloria, to Laura's legacy, and they just made that such, for me personally, such a wonderful experience to be there, and I also went back for the for the banner raising on opening night, and when that banner was raised up to Gloria, that that was, again, it's, you, there are really no words how I felt. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, even, you got to do something that I never got to do. Hopefully someday you got to meet the Stanley Cup. Uh, you talked to me about that before, about how the team arranged that. I think that was a, a really great thing that they did for you. Um, uh, Kathy, so I almost called to Laura. Kathy, uh, I thank you so much for spending this time. I welcome you to Blues Nation because you have told me you are now a true blue fan. And uh, yes. she bleeds blue just like I do. So, Kathy... This is Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan, saying, I'm bleeding blue with you, and I hope to see you again on another Blue Note Fan Report. Aloha, Kathy, and mahalo. Thank you, Guy. Wow, what a wonderful interview. Kathy is so nice, and the way she talks about Laura, I wish I could have met her. I wish she was still alive to have embraced this, to be part of this. I want to thank Bob Martin for throwing his question out there. It was a really good one. Uh, you guys are supporting me in ways that... that just it, it's making it fun much more fun than it ever has been to do this show lots of interviews lined up keep doing me a favor liking and sharing these videos and you never know you could be featured on the blue note fan report this is guy the hawaii blues fan and what am i doing that's right i'm bleeding blue with you but i'm not the only one right boys Blues! That's right, boys. Let's go Blues. And this is Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan, saying aloha, mahalo, and I'll see you on the next Blue Note Fan Report.